Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, September 21st, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. One of the questions I'm getting a lot when talking about incident response and forensics is where to start if you are confronted with an incident and of course doing so relatively quickly. Sometimes it's uh, pretty straightforward. You have a specific system and a specific piece of malware to deal with. Ransomware is always pretty straightforward, of course, to pin down because you usually have this warning screen telling you uh, what it's all about. But it can be difficult to analyze all the different logs that you may have access to. And again, speed often matters. So Russ today wrote about a nice tool to assist with this task, Chainsaw. Chainsaw is a simple command line tool that can read logs and extract relevant logs. And that's really the key here. You always have a ton of logs, but it's hard to find the couple lines that really matter. Chainsaw uses a common Sigma rule format. So you'll likely find some nice rule sets ready to use in addition to its on built-in rules. To demonstrate the capabilities of Chainsaw, Russ first used data from an older incident he worked on, and it did a great job identifying some of the relevant pieces of software involved in the incident. In addition, uh, Russ uh, then used data from APT Simulator, a tool that simulates activity that's sort of consistent with uh, what's commonly uh, known as APT attacks. This time, Russ used Chainsaw's built-in rules as well as some Sigma rules. And again, uh, Chainsaw's own rules found that an administrator account was added. That's, of course, always uh, nice to know. And uh, Sigma rules then identified password dumping activity and other relevant artifacts. More about this in Russ's uh, diary post. So in short, a very useful tool to at least get a decent first cut of what is odd and interesting. And since you sort of that uh, kind of triage is where this tool really fits in. And when we're talking about power distribution units or short PDUs, we usually talk about devices mounted in a server rack that allows for some degree of uh, remote control of power to various servers or other devices in the rack. In the older days, uh, these devices usually used good old Telnet, but uh, these days, there's usually you find some web-based interfaces and well, maybe sort of an SSH server in some cases. Now, Team 82 looked at a particular type of PDU, the or data probe iBoot PDU. And as you can imagine, I wouldn't be talking about it if they didn't find some interesting vulnerabilities. Team 82 found a total of seven vulnerabilities. Some of them can lead to remote code execution. One I like in particular, uh, there was a leftover file on the little web server that's running on uh, these PDUs. And uh, it essentially uh, was probably left behind from debugging because it sort of allowed downloading arbitrary uh, firmware from a GitHub repository. And uh, it didn't require any authentication and you could manipulate enough of the path that you could pretty much download software onto the device from any GitHub repository. And that's how you can pretty quickly get, for example, a web shell loaded. But well, uh, this is not where it ended. Uh, these kind of web vulnerabilities, of course, are uh, no big news. And I always tell you, don't expose these devices to the internet. And that provides, of course, some protection, but data probe added a special twist. So you don't want to expose that device directly to the internet, but you still want to have remote access to it. So what better way to do it than use the cloud? So the PDU will reach out to a cloud server and then with a um, a web browser, you can also connect to that uh, website and control your PDU remotely without exposing it directly. The problem here is that, well, uh, access control was broken on that website. Once you were authenticated, uh, you were able to connect to 
any PDU connected uh, to that particular website, which then of course allowed you essentially full control again. You could at the very least power cycle arbitrary devices connected to that PDU. Updated firmware has been made available and the cloud issues have also been fixed. Personally, for my PDUs, I still prefer a VPN connection in order to gain remote access to them. I don't really have any of these cloud devices yet. The vulnerability here reminds me very much of other similar devices that you usually find in home automation, like thermostats and the like. And tamper protection, a feature available in Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, will be turned on by default for all existing customer. The feature itself has been available since 2019, and new customers had already had it turned on by default uh, if they signed up beginning of this year, end of last year. What changes now is that all existing customer, let's call them legacy customers, will also find tamper protection turned on by default. It's probably a good thing. It does prevent users from altering their security settings. If you don't want to have it turned on, you can still turn it off explicitly in the Microsoft 365 Defender portal. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.